So I will quickly uh, introduce you the, the panelists. Uh, we have Mr. Walter Steyl, founder and director of the Product Life Institute in Geneva. We have Mr. Ernst von Weisecker, co-president of the club of Rome and chair of the International Panel of Sustainable Resource Use, and by the way, new board member of Green Cross International. We have Bernard Gecko, President, Sustainable Finance Geneva and Head of Impact Investing at Lombardier. And Nicola Fleury, Acting Deputy Secretary General, International Organization for Standardization. And also Mr. Stephen Stone, Chief Economics and Trade Branch, United Nations Environment Program, who will be the moderator. Mr. Stone, you have the floor. And Hey, thanks very much. And um, to those of you who are sitting out there, you should get the prize of endurance because you're going without a break. So if some of you need a coffee, just go get one and then come back because I'm sure the conversation will be much more exciting. And hopefully the, the whole tone will be much more interactive. That at least is my ambition for this session. Uh, it's coming at a very interesting time. So this conference is going on for a day and a half now. And this particular panel is about action. It's about acting. And I think the last session we heard some very interesting examples of people who are doing things, but the people on this panel uh, are really doing things. And they're also thought leaders as well as action leaders, if I can put it that way. Um, so I'd like to have a very interactive discussion with you, those of you who are out there, and hopefully it will be much more interactive um, than what I caught of the last session. Um, which will enable you to engage with the different panelists here. Um, my name is Stephen Stone, um, head of the Economics and Trade Branch here in Geneva, part of UNEP, the UN Environment Program. Um, and basically today, I just wanted to give you a broad sense of the landscape for the discussion. We haven't had a chance to really discuss, so we're going live without having had the chance of benefit of a prior conversation. But 2015, really interesting moment in time, uh, potentially, one of the hottest years on record. We'll probably hear more about that. Um, we're at a point in time when the global economy has more than quadrupled in the past 30, 40 years. So massive economic expansion, massive amount of people being lifted out of poverty. We also know that over 60% of ecosystems around the world are highly or significantly degraded. So growth is coming at a cost, major significant cost. Um, and yet, some promising shoots for optimism, such as the recent agreement between China and the US ahead of the climate conference in Paris, uh, such as the recent remarks of Mark Carney, the uh, head of the Bank of England, responsible also as the head of the Financial Stability Board, talking about how the instability of the climate may become material uh, for our economy and for our well-being. So a very interesting moment in time, and what I'd like to do is kick it off uh, by asking our panelists some questions. The first one, looking back a little bit, looking back, uh, based on your experience, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Van Weizsäcker. Uh, he was introduced, but let me just highlight again. Uh, Ernst is a co-president of the Club of Rome. He's a former member of the German Bundestag. He's also been the president of the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment, and Energy, and he is on the UNEP uh, International Resource Panel, so someone I know and whose contributions uh, I value and UNEP values very highly. So Ernst, just to kick it off, looking back, uh, what are the signs of hope? What have been promising or perhaps concrete examples of people doing things that give you hope and, and what can be done to take them forward? Ernst. Let me start with what we heard five or ten minutes ago. It seems to be good for business to go into sustainable development. And many companies are doing it. We heard encouraging stories this morning. However, it's not good enough. What has collapsed, this was said yesterday by uh, Gary Jacobs, 
is the balance between private and public. A moment ago, you heard the representative of Caterpillar saying, the state should not tell us which technologies, but the state should set the frame that those who are doing the right things make better business. And today, the state is almost unable to do it. So this has to be changed. Now, coming back to good experiences and stories, if you wish, when I was a member of parliament, we took the um, unbelievably courageous decision of the feed-in tariffs law in Germany. At the time, all economists, without exception, said, you are completely crazy, giving the uh, solar panel people two Deutschmarks per kilowatt hour fed into the grid. You're completely mad doing it. We did it nevertheless, and it triggered off a worldwide boom of renewable energies. With the fabulous um, sort of unbelievable situation that the more solar energy is used on the market, the cheaper it's get, it gets. With oil or coal or nearly all commodity, commodities, it's the opposite. The more you use, the, the dearer it gets. And here, we have a self-accelerating mechanism which is, of course, doing what Bill Ritter yesterday said, that the coal industry is losing shareholder value in an unbelievable, at an unbelievable speed, because they are still in that old economy where using more makes it more expensive. Okay, so that is good news. Let me, however, add that there are also lots of problems. Last week, the 2030 agenda was adopted by the United Nations. Wonderful. But nobody was speaking of the trade-offs between the 12 big socio-economic sustainable development goals and the three tiny ecological um, sustainable development goals. If those 12 become a real success, that would be the end to biodiversity, uh, stabilized climate, and many other such, such things, unless we make a real massive decoupling of economic and social well-being from resource consumption. And this essentially is the agenda of the International Resource Panel. But it won't happen unless and until the public sector, the state, is entitled and able to increase uh, prices for the use, not to say destruction, of natural resources, including energy. So, this is a big agenda. It won't happen as long as the mindset prevails that, by definition almost, according to economists, um, the private sector is better and more efficient than the state. So let's forget about the state. It can't happen unless we have a good balance between the state and the private sector. Thank you. And that, that's brilliant. And that sets an excellent frame for our reflection. The role of the state, is it stepping up at the same time that the private sector needs to step up? And in what measure? And, you know, with that question, I'd like to come to you, uh, Walter. 
Uh, Dr. Walter Stahel, he's a Swiss citizen. He's the founder and director of the Product Life Institute in Geneva. So someone who thinks about these issues quite a lot, advises on these issues quite a lot. I imagine to both public and private sector as well. So Walter, just continuing this conversation forward, you know, some examples of the state getting it right. What could be done to scale that up and how do we actually reach that equilibrium that Ernst is talking about between the drive for sustainable growth, for growth in incomes, growth in jobs, and this fragile ecosystem from which we draw the wealth. <coughs> Walter. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Well, I think the role of the state is obviously multiple, but the most important one, I think, is taxation, which today is kind of weird because we tax labor. So nation states invest 10 years into educating people to learn them a trade, profession, but when they are, have finished, if then they are stupid and going to work, they will be immediately taxed. If they are intelligent, they simply become unemployed and continue to be paid uh, by the state without working. So the system is weird. You should promote the people in work. You should make sure they are creative, they use their skills and help the ones that don't find a job to find a job. But for God's sake, that their health, wealth, both of them are created by work, especially for young people. So my suggestion for what I call a sustainable taxation is very simple. Do not tax renewable resources. And people are a renewable resource, like trees. So tax the non-renewable resources. If you do that, you immediately will give very strong economic incentives to industry to move to a circular economy, to move to making better use of uh, resources of uh, second-hand materials. All these activities are labor-intensive. So if you take the taxation of labor and put it on resources, any strategy that may use more labor but saves a lot of resources will become much more attractive than it is today. And the second one is equally simple. <coughs> value added tax is exactly what it should be on value added activities. The circular economy of reuse, repair, recycle, remanufacture is value preservation. So any activity of the circular economy that is preserving value shouldn't be levied by TVA, by value added tax, logically. So it's, it's no rocket science, it's only apply logic. And then the second role, I think, if it, that is unemployed today is uh, public procurement. Uh, public administrations should buy performance guaranteed services, not um, products. And now, unfortunately, the uh, U.S. Admiral has gone, but the U.S. administration is actually a prime example for buying services. Uh, you remember the space shuttles of NASA, the good old days, they were owned and operated <coughs> by NASA. Now, NASA only buys services, transporting goods to the International Space Station, for example, etc. And this decision to buy services instead of goods has led to an explosion of startups in the US that are now developing extremely innovative solutions 
for NASA. So the space shuttle will be replaced by equipment that is owned and operated by private companies that is dematerialized. It's really ridiculous if you com compare the SpaceX things to a space shuttle, for example. And um, so if this if the state buys, if public procurement buys, we want the best solution, we want the best performance, that immediately <coughs> gives a, a push to any innovative entrepreneur or startup mm. to, to think about this. If the state buys products, well, okay, you sell them products. Mm. Thanks very much, uh, Walter, and you've touched on some really interesting concepts, the one about performance in particular, and dematerializing consumption, and actually value addition as well. Um, I want to turn to our next panelist, um, who is uh, Nicolas Fleury. He is um, currently the Acting Deputy Secretary General of ISO, the International Standards Organization, got that right here in Geneva. Um, this organization has a tremendously important job because they set the bar for quality. And many of you probably heard of ISO 9000, ISO 14000. Um, so Nicola, some examples of um, where you know the government has got it right, the private sector has got it right, some good examples looking backwards and how to scale them up. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Stephen. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I have a very good example to give you, I think. Uh, um, but to come back to our activities, so ISO and its members, it's uh, 162 members around the world. So they are working uh, actually very hard uh, to provide uh, these 21st century solutions uh, actually uh, needed to face uh, today's challenges as we discussed uh, uh, yesterday. And we are not the only ones here in Geneva, actually. We have ITU, we have the IC just next door working to provide these solutions. I think the thing is, is that we want these solutions. That's a lot of work that is involved with lots of stakeholders participating to the development of these tools. We want to see them implemented. A very good, I think, example is it relates to Germany. And yesterday also, uh, Peter made a, uh, gave a good example uh, from ILO of, of uh, the, uh, the positive results observed around energy consumption uh, in, uh, in Germany. Here, in fact, we have directives uh, at the European level or uh, national laws at uh, a national level uh, encouraging really the implementation of the tools like, for example, the, the uh, ISO 50001 or energy management standards. So, and what we could see is really a boost, first of all, in terms of the implementation of such standards with, in fact, very concrete results, uh, uh, savings for these companies uh, implementing these standards up to 25% of their consumptions uh, on a yearly basis. So quite uh, impressive results in the end. So I think that's a very good example of the balance of uh, we were just uh, uh, talking about. So if we work hand in hand, and on one side, we have these solutions developed and really have the state politicians taking decision, acting like Adam was saying uh, yesterday also, and pushing for these solutions to implement it in the various way we were just discussing, I think we can really achieve a fantastic job. Yeah. Thanks very much, Nicola. I'm just going to ask a very short question. Do firms complain when you set the standard? Do you get a lot of negative feedback when you set the bar high? Uh, no, actually, in fact, the firms do, in fact, but maybe uh, I can explain this a little bit later during that panel, but the way we are working is to uh, invite all stakeholders interested in the standards or in a specific topics, and actually they participate and they define what's going to be in the standards. So they, defin uh, they define, as we say in French, uh, la sauce à laquelle ils seront mangés. And uh, I think that's very important, and in my view, that's a key condition to have these standards implemented. They are deciding of the bar they commit to, uh, to reach, and that's, I think, quite a strength in, uh, in the ISO system. Yeah, that is a fantastic uh, public good in a way, because they're establishing the standard as a public good, which they all right. commit to. Very, very interesting. Um, our last panelist, uh, who I've saved for last on purpose, uh, is Bertrand Gacon. Am I pronouncing that right? That's right. Uh, Bertrand is um, 
the president of Sustainable Finance Geneva. So this is a clustering of perhaps progressive uh, financiers based in Geneva. He's also the head of impact investing at Lombard, ODA and company. Um, so Bertrand, the, the scene is, is very interesting now from my point of view because you know, you've got Mark Carney making very interesting statements about the need for financial stability and its links to um, the way markets allocate capital and some of the decisions that, that they make. Um, some positive examples from the past that you've seen in your capacity and how they might be scaled up. Sure. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, good morning, everybody. Well, there has been many, um, many innovations over the last recent years in the financial industry. But if I had to pick one, uh, and one of the recent years, it would certainly be the uh, the green bond market, and then how that industry really uh, uh, grew dramatically uh, over the last two years. So, in 2014, there uh, the uh, global uh, issuances for uh, green bonds uh, reached about 40 billion USD, which is uh, still uh, a drop in the ocean if we compare to the uh, size of the overall uh, financial market. But uh, if uh, we relate that amount to uh, uh, the uh, what is needed to actually uh, fight against uh, uh, climate change, because uh, green bonds is more on the climate change topic, then this is starting to be a quite significant amount of money. And I think that the two things in my view that are I found very promising and uh, with, with the green bond uh, developments, the, the first one is that for the first time we have a mainstream product. You know, most of the time impact investing is all about finding interesting small companies, private companies, alternative classes that are very hard for many investors to actually consider investing in their portfolios. With green bonds, we have a very mainstream instrument that uh, any investors, private, public, um, uh, governments, uh, pension funds, all of them can invest in those instruments. And if you see, uh, again, on the right balance between public and private sectors, I mean, this, this was a very good example of how you can uh, start an initiative from um, um, supranational uh, organization, because it was the World Bank initially that, uh, that uh, tested and, and launched those, uh, those types of instruments, but then the market is really being uh, largely uh, dominated by the private sector. And most of the funds now are coming from the private sector. And even issuers are coming from the private sector. So for the first time, we have a mainstream instrument that is making it possible for the private sector to actually finance a climate mitigation project very easily. And I think the second um, dimension, which I found very interesting in the, uh, in the green bond industry, is the fact that for the first time, uh, we, we, we go beyond I mean, as an investor, we go beyond trying to assess the who, you know, who is the issuer? What level of risk am I taking with that issuer? We start taking into, into consideration the what. What am I financing with that instrument? Um, and this is all about, uh, I mean, the, the green bonds is really all about understanding the what, you know, what project, what uh, what uh, geothermal plant am I going to finance in Indonesia or what uh, renewable or solar farm am I going to finance in, in Costa Rica? And, and so this is really introducing a very important movement, I guess, in the financial community uh, where we start considering, you know, uh, what is my money actually going to finance at the end of the day and, and whether that a project or that business or that development or that innovation, what is it going to bring to, to society? And and so I think that's one of the um, what are, one of the examples I would probably uh, pick if I had to choose one promising and, and scalable uh, industry in the financial sector over the last few years. Thanks very much for that, Bertrand. It's, it is really a fascinating development. I, I seem to recall the African Development Bank issuing a green bond and it being oversubscribed in like 24 or 48 hours. Yeah. So yeah. huge, huge appetite out there. Um, I want to take a pause, see if there's any burning questions out in the audience. See if you're still awake. Okay, you're not still awake. You should have laughed. That was a joke. Um, are there any burning questions out there for any of the panelists? If there are, just say who you are, what your burning question is, not your statement, please. Your question, and we'll take three before we go on to the next round. Any questions? Okay, we've got somebody awake back there. Uh, just to let us know who you are and for whom is your question. Um, hi, my name is Jay Burton and I'm an environmental student and I studied EEG and the feed-in tariffs uh, in Germany. So I have a question to um, uh, Weizsäcker. So this year the European Union stated... <laughs> I 
Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, the European Union stated that they wanted to implement the EEG uh, at the European scale. And I wanted to ask if you think that's actually possible, because you said that it was very difficult to actually implement this in Germany. And even though it was a success, I really want to ask if you think that it is possible because of all uh, the disagreements that we're having at a European scale and if it is also possible to do globally also. So that will be my general question. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks very much. Short and sweet and very precise. Any other burning questions? This is your chance. None? Okay. So, Ernst, you have a very precise question and then we'll launch into our second round. Oddly, in the history of the European Union, energy was not in the mandate. It came only very late. And I believe the legal frame does not exist for the EU to adopt the equivalent of the feed-in tariffs law, which in German we call EEG or EEG. Um, but we could have a directive obliging member countries to implement it in national law. This can we can do. The trouble is that the British have consistently blocked all attempts in the EU of harmonizing anything relating to taxes. But what Walter Sahel said was absolutely right. And that should be part and parcel of a European feed-in tariffs law. So, I mean, the experience over the last 18 months has been that the British are blocking everything. Uh, so, they would also block this one. Nevertheless, I believe it would be a good idea. And let's leave some room open for um, lateral decisions or movements on behalf of the British. You never know. They might step up to the plate. And um, so I'd like to keep it moving now. We've sort of looked back, and the idea was really to harvest uh, what's worked in the past, and, and you have um, some very interesting thoughts here. But now I'd like to look forward a little bit, just for the next round of questions. And the forward-looking question is this. We're heading into the climate conference in Paris. Um, 2016 uh, will be an important year as well because of the follow-on, the Green Climate Fund is becoming established, uh, the financial markets are starting to turn their attention, the sustainable development goals, as you noted, uh, Ernst, are now adopted, how do we implement them? Um, and so the question of scale becomes interesting and the avenues in particular for leveraging, uh, leveraging change. So the ideas that you can have, the ideas that may be here with the panelists, to actually create some of those changes that are so desperately needed. Um, so that's really the, the second round. I'd like to go in a different, slightly different order this time. Um, so uh, Nicola, I think I will come to you first, and then I'll sort of bob around the panel. Um, looking forward, you know, the promising avenues, this can even be speculative, but where, where are the leverage points from, from your point of view? So, I think from our experience, maybe um, what we were, uh, I was just describing at the beginning uh, related to, uh, to the process uh, to, uh, to elaborate the, the standards could be, in fact, an, ex uh, an interesting uh, experience and uh, uh, maybe a, a solution or a kind of approach to break these institutional, uh, political or cultural barriers we, we were discussing yesterday. Uh, just things, ISO standards are the result, as, uh, as I was saying, of discussions between many different stakeholders across the world representing the industry, uh, governments, NGOs, labor organizations, consumer, uh, scientific experts. They are all having uh, different interests, uh, all having very different views. But we have a process, and this is where I see the magic here, where in the end they are capable of talking uh, to each other together and agree on a common solution. 
So I think in terms of inclusiveness and sustainability of the things we do, this approach is extremely strong. Uh, a concrete example, uh, you may be familiar, and this morning, in fact, uh, um, our speaker from SGS talked about uh, 26,000, uh, the standards we have published on social responsibility. Just think that these standards uh, represent a common view between more than 500 experts from very different countries, about 100 different countries, and very different stakeholder groups. And it worked. So uh, I think that this model could be replicated at, uh, at different levels. I would hope that in the coming conference also, we can have such an approach where people really talk together, fix a common goal and objectives, and decide to act and to build something concrete that they commit to put in place. That's, I think, a good example I would, uh, I would try to, uh, to present. But, um, thanks very much for that. I mean, it, it also speaks to the power of collective behavior yeah. when you focus your minds on things. And I think it's very appropriate from, from the UN, although we're not always characterized by camaraderie, there is obviously a, a large function there in the public good that, for which we're responsible. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that I almost wanted to ask to Bertrand, but do you, uh, do you have standards for financial products? Uh, <coughs> Yes, uh, there's a range of standards on, on, on financial aspects, financial products specifically. Uh, I need to check. We have a catalog of 21,000 standards, which are all current. Uh, so I don't know them all by heart. But uh, uh, financial sector is kind of a, an activity we are working on as well. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks very much for that. Okay, Bertrand, coming to you now. You've got some measures. The question is on the green bonds as well. You know, how do you know what you're buying? Right? How do you actually follow the value chain to where the impact is? And how do you know you're actually buying a green bond? That's sort of a specific follow-up question. You're supposed to be asking the polemic questions, by the way, not me. So please stay on your toes. And then, you know, beyond that sort of pointed question, where do you see the market going? And how do you contribute to making the market go in the way you want it to go? Right. Well, this is an, an excellent question, which is probably at the heart of the uh, entire impact investing movement. I mean, if you are to be serious about using investment as a way to promote change and the new model, then you have to be serious in how you measure that. And so um, uh, standards is part of the work um, to give some clarity and visibility to uh, investors so they can, you know, the uh, same way as a fair trade consumer, you will turn towards uh, Max Havla or other types of uh, certification, then to some extent you can use that uh, in the uh, green finance or impact investing industry. Uh, but more than that, we also need innovation. We also need, um, I mean, more importantly, we probably need to uh, help investors making the right decision, which, which is not easy today because they're just lacking most of the information they need to make that right decision. So uh, uh, more information, if I, if I would maybe uh, uh, try to, um, to think about how we can help investors and um, economic players making better investment decision, um, I would probably um, identify three areas where we need to, to progress uh, for the future. Um, the first one would be, uh, I mean, that is really something which is not new, but uh, uh, it would be long-term long -term investing. How, how can you uh, incentivize long-term investing over a very short-term investment decision, which is very often uh, are pushing us, uh, you know, making the wrong decisions. Um, uh, and, and, and even from the, uh, for the performance standpoint, I mean, many players are just uh, uh, using short-term uh, uh, information because because they lack long-term information. So uh, I think this is partly the role of, uh, uh, of governments and public authorities, but this is also a role of the, uh, of the financial community itself. You know? um, we, we've moved to a point where even the notion of uh, shareholding um, you know, to me, is, 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 has, got, has gotten to a point where we're far away from, from what it, it was meant to be. I mean, when you, you become shareholder of a company, it's because you believe in the strategy of that company over the long term. And, and so being able to buy your share in the morning and sell the, the share of the same company two minutes after you've bought it, you know, it's, it's a nonsense from the, uh, from the financial and economical standpoint. So long term is, is one first area. Um, then I would uh, probably um, uh, come back to uh, what Mr. Ferrari was uh, saying this, this morning. A very important point for investors is to be able to, uh, to price externalities. I mean, as long as this information is nowhere available, 
then there is no way for an investor to actually make informed decision. So uh, uh, if they don't pay the cost or they cannot integrate that in, in, into their investment decision, they cannot make uh, good, well-informed investments and decisions. So uh, I think the, obviously the, uh, the, the carbon markets was one example of an initiative, initiative going in that way. We all know that it has not been as successful uh, as we would all have uh, uh, liked it to be, but this is no reason for not, uh, you know, keep trying and then try to find the right mechanism and the right way. Uh, carbon is really not this, the only way where we should be developing more uh, instrument like that. Uh, we could be doing the same on social aspects as well, on, on uh, resource efficiency, on many other aspects. And, uh, and, and being able to internalize and have information on those externalities both positive and negative. And, and last but not least, the third point I would probably mention, uh, where the financial community itself is uh, making uh, quite significant progress, is, um, um, is is developing impact indicators for investors. You know, uh, many companies, including Lombardier, are starting to develop ways of calculating the carbon carbon footprint of a, of, of an investment portfolio. You know, um, this sounds to be uh, th this sounds a little bit uh, trivial, but uh, actually, what is measured get managed. So. Uh, starting to promote, educate, and provide our clients and investors with a simple way to measure the carbon footprint or their investment and understand that by changing that portfolio, they would have a very different results in terms of how many kilograms or tons of CO2 they had financing through their investment. That's already helping them to uh, you know, change the way they invest. So uh, that's the three areas I think we should be uh, acting on uh, for the uh, coming months. And to, be, uh, to, to stay on a very positive note, I have to say that things are moving quite fast. Um, they probably remained a very niche and very specific area within the financial communities for many years. But we now um, really are witnessing a quite uh, significant and, uh, and, uh, and fast changing movement in the financial community. And uh, I'm quite uh, confident that uh, we will uh, move there much quicker than what we anticipated. Thank you for that, uh, Petron, and also for the optimism. I, I share it. I mean, there are um, trends that are exponential in, in nature. I think um, Dr. Van Weizsäger has, has documented some of those in the Wuppertal Institute, but there are huge response capabilities of humans as well, and, and the markets that we've created to uh, shape our behavior. Um, I'm going to do a 30-second infomercial here. The UNEP's inquiry into the design of su sustainable financial markets which is hosted actually by Switzerland and UNEP and a number of other forward thinking shareholders, to use the term that, will launch its uh, final report at Lima uh, later this week, actually tomorrow, in fact, at the IMF World Bank annual meetings in Lima. So if you're connected to the internet, Google inquiry and UNEP, and you will have the latest thinking coming out of actually a lot of financial sector thinkers, including central banks and regulators and standards and standard and poor's and others, um, which and I think takes your point forward. You want to yeah, talk if, I, if I just may uh, add a tribute to the uh, Geneva community, because it's, you're right, I mean, many initiatives and innovations uh, within the financial sector are, are coming from Geneva and, and from Switzerland. Uh, more globally, and I think uh, we, we should realize that uh, we have here locally a very um, dense uh, pool of expertise and resources in, in, in the uh, green finance. So uh, thanks, Geneva. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Walter, I'm going to come to you. Uh, we've talked about pricing externalities. We've heard about long-term investing. We've heard about standards, information, so that consumers and investors can make good decisions. Um, just thinking forward, you know, 2015, looking outward, the 2030 agenda, you know, where do we need to put our emphasis and what are the promising avenues in your view? Thank you, Stephen. I think we have a splendid occasion at the moment because energy is basically free, capital is free or even negative interests. So we have everything we need to be innovative but we kind of uh, are lacking ideas now if we look at the the whole circular economy and the whole resource efficiency there is one uh, problem that in recycling 
you are producing secondary resources, but you are in a, at the point of sale up against virgin resources. And virgin resources are always 100% pure. Secondary raw materials are very often, except for gold, not 999.9% .9 purity. And so therefore we have a quality problem in addition to some other ones. But the quality problems we could overcome if we invest research and development on all levels into de-alloying metal alloys. We have to be able that if we make stainless steel from nickel and chromium and steel or iron, we should be able to get these three elements separately back. Because otherwise you go in a downhill spiral and your stainless steel after three lap loops ends up in uh, reinforcement bars for the construction industry. So we have to recycle atoms. And the nice thing about this, it probably uses a lot of energy in the beginning. Well, we have plenty of energy at the moment. And it's something you can patent. You can actually put a patent on it at, uh, if you have the best idea. And then you, you can make it whole new service industry uh, creating money from research. So this should basically attract a lot of com a lot of companies and countries. I know at least one country that has already found the idea very convincing because of course it would also be useful to have some knowledge in metallurgy. And the same thing can be done with plastics. We can depolymerize plastics, at least nylon polyamide has already been done. And because then we get the monomer back. And the monomer is much more valuable than burning the stuff in order to recover the heat or something. So again, we have to recycle these elements at the highest economic value if we want to compete against virgin products. I think that's that good, good for the moment. Okay, I'll definitely come back suffice. to you. And um, I think uh, Ernst, we're heading up your alley because we're talking a lot about resources and productivity. And uh, the central point that I want to um, echo here that you've just left with us, Walter, is we don't lack resources per se, we lack ideas. Resources, although they are infinite, are huge. And Bertrand, you know the scope of the global economy, our total wealth out there exceeds well over $200 trillion. There are a lot of resources out there. Perhaps the scarce resources are our ideas and how to live better uh, among the, the scarce resources that we have. So Ernst, I'm coming to you, some forward thinking. Where are the pressure points? Where are the avenues for change given our moment in history? Walter has just mentioned the question of alloys and so recycling is not always an easy thing. Remanufacturing can make it a little better because then you can reuse the alloys, etc. But coming to your question and picking up from what Bertrand said about externalities. In the second decoupling report of our International Resource Panel, published last year, you will find a really innovative idea for dealing with externalities. <clears throat> it is to politically decide to increase the price of energy, of water, of minerals each year by the percentage of documented 
efficiency increases in the previous year. So that's what you have to pay for energy services, mineral services, etc. Doesn't got mo get more expensive next year. But investors will know that this ping pong between efficiency and prices will go on. And for Lombardier and their clients, it would be a paradise knowing something about resource prices 15 years from now. And that would make impact uh, investment and sustainable investment a very lucrative business. But it requires a strong state capable of making the prediction come true. And uh, one more historic, um, well, justification of the idea is the biggest success story, in a sense, of civilization has been the Industrial Revolution since 150 years or so, perhaps 200, in which we also had a ping pong between the increase of labor productivity triggering higher wages. Higher wages triggered more incentive to be better at labor productivity. And this went on and on and on, ending up with a 20-fold, in many sectors, a 100-fold increase of labor productivity, which is the basis of our wealth today. But today, labor is not in short supply, ask the guys from ILO. Um, resources are. I mean, we have a new report to the Club of Rome by, uh, um, uh, by um, Ugo Bardi, who says, of course, there are lots of resources still in the ground, but getting them in clean form is an extremely dirty affair. 150 years ago, finding, uh, finding some gold was Luck was great. Today, gold mining is one of the dirtiest businesses of all because it's so thinly spread. So we really have a scarcity problem because of the dirt. And uh, so it is going to make this a better place, a better world, if the scarce resource in a ping pong fashion gets more expensive and the not so scarce resource will be relieved. And this is exactly what Walter has been saying in the first place. I, I think it's a very compelling vision. Um, I'm just going to ask you to flesh that out a little bit. Because um, what we, and then I will come to you, Bertram. Because in, the, in this vision of increasing labor productivity and labor shedding and labor saving that we saw with the past 100 years, um, we know in some senses that resources are becoming more scarce, some resources, as you say, for the reasons, but we don't see uh, prices going up. We see a commodity glut right now for some things. Is this cyclical? I mean, what's, is it beyond a fiscal problem of taxation and prices reflecting, or is there something cyclical? Or how are you seeing that so that, you know, if I was a policymaker and I would just say, Ernst, well, you know, that's just a business cycle. If, of course, if you believe that markets are better than the state, you fall into this trap. Let me give you an historical example. During the 1970s until roughly 1981 or so, energy prices rose and were very high. And then they plummeted. Denmark decided to completely compensate the plummeting prices by taxes so that the price for the user remained very high in Denmark. And it was Bonanza 
for the exchequer. They always, all, all of a sudden, had money. And this is the beginning of the Danish economic miracle. It was good for Denmark to compensate the markets, not to follow the markets. So, thank you very much for that. That was excellent. And uh, I hope you're really waking up now. Bertrand, I'm going to come to you. Now, Ernst has just laid something down. This would be paradise for Lombard and ODA. If you had certainty, price certainty, would it be? Why or why not? Well, at least what we can say is that impact investing is already a um, interesting area from the financial performance uh, standpoint. So um, uh, even without any integration of uh, externalities, cost, or whether positive or negative externalities, by the way, even if we're not able to do that right now, and we should all be working on that in the next few years uh, ahead, but even today, um, in many circumstances, um, impact investing products are delivering at least the same level of returns than we have with uh, mainstream investments. Uh, we've launched a fund um, more than one year ago, um, which is in, uh, in microfinance and, and, and access to basic services for the uh, bottom of the pyramid. And uh, we're uh, doing better than the uh, MSCI world over the last same period. So uh, uh, an investor is choosing to uh, use his money or her money to uh, promote these types of activities, inclusive economic activities. Uh, they would be better off at the end of the day from the social impact standpoint, obviously, but also from the financial standpoint. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so this is why I'm also being optimistic for the future of that uh, industry, is because when you can demonstrate that there is no trade-off between financial performance for the investors mm. and achieving, you know, um, uh, social change, positive social change or environmental change, then there's, you, you're lifting up one of the major barriers and uh, it will take time to educate investors and demonstrate that and establish the track record because we all know that the financial community is not the more um, prone to uh, quick change. If I could say so, we need to have time to demonstrate and, and build an, a track record on that, an history of performance. But once this is done, I mean, there is no more reason why investors should not be integrating that a lot more quickly than, than what they're doing today. And, um, and yes, um, there will be some specific areas with or without the uh, involvement of the government. I think government could do a lot. Uh, but I think even without that, there's already many areas within the sustainable investment or impact investing uh, industry uh, where we can demonstrate a very positive returns for the investors, definitely. Thanks very much for that. So we've completed two rounds. Uh, you're hearing the threads that are weaving this together, pricing, information, decisions, uh, transparency, collective behavior for problem solving. Um, you have before you, four really interesting panelists, so please take advantage of this opportunity. Is there a thread that we've missed? Is there an angle that we haven't touched on that's important? And again, rather than a statement, I'd really love to hear a question to keep the dialogue forward moving. Um, we have space for a couple of questions, if you could identify yourself and then your question. So I've got one here in the front, one in the back, third one going, going, going. Okay, we'll give you a chance. For the gentleman in the front, please. Je m'excuse, je vais poser ma question en français euh, tout doucement. Euh, ma question est très simple. Euh, on n'a pas parlé de la possibilité... Qui êtes, qui Romain êtes... Ferrari, pardon. Ah, oui. <rire> on n'a pas évoqué la possibilité de modifier les règles de comptabilité des entreprises et des organismes publics. Euh, vous savez, la comptabilité moderne date de la fin du 19e siècle. Elle a pour objectif la conservation du capital technique. Si une entreprise déprécie son capital technique, son résultat diminue. Euh, il y a beaucoup de travaux qui ont été faits ces 30 dernières années, Wagner Nagel par exemple, euh, d'autres en France, sur l'introduction du capital environnemental et du capital humain dans les modes de comptabilité. Est-ce que vous pensez que ces solutions sont viables et est-ce qu'un jour elles pourraient émerger Merci beaucoup pour la question. The gentleman there in the back. Martin Wilderer is my name. I'm with EQI, a data and tech company connecting sustainability information with uh, the financial information, the, the profitability in a company. 
we heard about information need, externalities. Um, I see a lot of requests for information, but also see confusion through too much information. How do we draw this together to give investors, but also companies, a clear direction? Excellent question. Thanks very much. A third question. Did I see one burning? Yes. Okay. So the gentleman there, towards the back. Yes. Hello. My, my name is Andre Lambos. I'm French German lawyer and I'm a member of the board of Green Budget Europe. Um, what I'd like to say is um, I'm missing a little bit of new ideas, like the idea that, that Ernst just mentioned uh, in Denmark. And I will give you two examples. One inside, um, maybe um, you've heard that uh, Greenpeace Sweden uh, just offered to participate in buying a German uh, lignite excavation uh, plant. So they, they like to, to buy um, a lignite excavation plant to, to avoid the excavation. So do we need new models uh, as well for CO2 pricing um, uh, for, for structure that avoid uh, CO2 emissions? Uh, the second question is, um, I mean, we know right now money is really, really cheap. Um, so how is it possible that, that we can't really um, trigger um, the um, uh, energy efficiency issue? If you, if you go to uh, lots of countries, um, you, you can find everywhere very, very inefficient buildings, very, very inefficient uh, plants uh, among uh, companies. And I think there we have a lot of business cases. Um, so I have been as well quite happy with uh, what uh, the general from the United States has, because when he said climate change is uh, a threat multiplier, I think that's really what, what, we, uh, what we're going to face. And uh, um, if we don't um, um, handle the CO2 pricing, and uh, there we really need to, to lift it up so that um, if we avoid CO2 emissions, we need to put a price on it. And that could be on one side um, handling better efficiency issues, and on the other side, well, letting uh, carbon or letting uh, lignite or letting oil in the soil. Excellent. Thank you. The two very important points. Um, any last burning question before I turn it over to our panelists? This side of the room is not drinking coffee. No, no green tea, no burning questions over here? Okay. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to the panelists. Um, in terms of time, are we okay? Do we have 10 minutes to, yeah? Yeah. Ah, good. Thank you. Thank you, Ernst. Yes, to, you, uh, to the lady. One more. Debbie King in Tandem Business Services. Interested in the thread of leadership? which you haven't really covered, I believe. So what, what issues are in place, do we think, and to what extent can issues such as recruitment, remuneration, bonuses, appraisal, and coaching give us greener, genuine greener and active leaders and CEOs, or do you think it is a matter of luck? It's a big thing to leave to luck. Okay, thanks very much for those questions. Um, so we're going to turn it over to the panelists, and I think what we'll do at the same time is enable you to uh, leave a couple of take-home messages, because probably once we spin through the panel one more time, we'll meet uh, the lunch hour, which is usually hard and fast. Um, I'm going to start here with you, Bertrand. There's some very interesting questions about pricing, carbon pricing, uh, information needs, but information overloads, and the interesting question about behavior as well and the incentive structure. So, you. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I, I might maybe, if you like, if you if you allow me, I would I would start with Mr. Ferrari's uh, question about the uh, accounting uh, norms and guidelines. And this is uh, actually a, a very good point. I mean, uh, I've read a paper a couple of years ago uh, whose title, I mean, it was written by a a hedge fund manager, if I if I remember correctly, which is uh, not uh, someone who's used to go into the impact investing space. But the title of the paper was Your Grandchildren Have No Value. And it was all about the fact that with the uh, discounted cash flow methods that we uh, all use uh, in the investment community, I mean, something, a, a negative externality that will happen in 20 years down the line uh, has almost no cost today, you know, because you would just discount it year after year. And so uh, even though as a manager today, you know that in maybe 20 years, it will cost you 500 million. The 500 million in 20 years is, you know, what? You know, it's it's a couple of thousand bucks today. You know, so uh, basically, when you make a decision, if you just if you just take into account those uh, financial issues, then you will discount it the price of your grandchildren. They are worth nothing. They are worth almost nothing in today's money. And 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 so changing the way we actually treats the uh, accounting 
uh, in the in in the, in the developed economy is is one of the very important points if we want to actually make a significant change. Um, now, maybe another question was about the. Uh, um, the, uh, how we can make it simple for the investors to go there. So I already mentioned the fact that uh, certification uh, about sustainable investing is one way. Uh, it is not the single way, and, and, and I'm also uh, a bit concerned that uh, given how uh, recent and new is the impact investing and sustainable investing industry, um, introducing certification today might also uh, you know, uh, hinder uh, innovation. Uh, because every player would like to fit into that certification, so we have to be careful with that. Uh, governments also here are playing a role. The uh, uh, United um, uh, Europe has introduced a couple of years ago a new form of investment vehicle, which is called the USEF, uh, European Social uh, Enterprise Fund. And so there's a numbers of vehicles or labels or certification we can introduce, but we should, uh, more importantly, uh, the financial community has to refine the indicators that we use as a, as a, to measure the social impact. So uh, it took the financial community probably a couple of centuries before we could come up with uh, standardized uh, financial indicators. Uh, so we take probably a couple of years because before we can we can get there with the same social or envir environmental impact indicators. But we're getting there. I mean, there is a number of initiatives going there, and so the more. I mean, the, the, if we're a little bit patient, I'm sure that uh, maybe in five to ten years' time, we will have integrated some couple of KPIs more um, uh, systematically into the portfolios. I will maybe also uh, finish with the, um, uh, if, if we still have time, with the uh, energy efficiency case. Um, I think that's a good illustration of also how innovation can um, uh, break some of the uh, um, cycles that we have that preventing companies from actually acting. Uh, I came across a Swiss-based fund manager that has started a new fund in the uh, energy efficiency sector, and they basically realized that for many companies, the business case was strong, but it's just that because they have so many other things to do, and so many, when, when they have investment capacity, this is to develop their, their own business rather than, you know, to insulate their buildings. So what they developed is a, is a fund whereby they would uh, raise money from investors. They would use that money to make the actual works, insulate the buildings, for instance. So the company doesn't have to pay. But then the company is signing a contract whereby for every euro saved in the energy bill at the end of the day, they would retrocede the money to uh, to the fund manager. So for the company, they become more efficient at no cost, even making a profit, small profit, because they do not retrocede the 100% of the uh, of the savings. And the fund managers can deliver a, a quite significant performance to the investors with that. So they're basically breaking the cycle and making it possible by pre-financing those uh, those insulation work for those businesses to actually do that. So innovation is also, financial innovation here can also, it's also a good way to uh, actually uh, get things started. <clears throat> Thanks very much for that, Bertrand. There definitely some innovative ideas, and I just want to probe you on that a little bit more. For example, the principles for responsible investment or the principles for responsible insurance or sustainable insurance. I mean, how much value do these things have for the kind of question that um, Roman Ferrari raised as well? How relevant are these for the investor community? Well, I think that's a very positive signal overall. Um, um, and I think the way the PRI was developed and implemented and then now changing is quite smart, actually. Um, uh, to be honest, when it started, it was more of a um, voluntary basis, um, you know, um, uh, not binding type of, of, of agreement. So every investor, you know, just to demonstrate that they are willing to play their part would sign the PRI, even though, to be honest, in terms of actual change in their investment processes, that would be very limited. But then later on, once they have raised that amount of uh, 2,000 major investment companies being involved, mm -hmm. they tightened up the uh, conditions to uh, remain a PRI signatory. Now you have more reporting obligation. It used to be confidential. Now it's, it's all being dis disclosed. And so now investors uh, or investment companies that have signed those PRIs a couple of years ago with not so many constraints and not so many obligations to actually do things, they are pushed to one more action. Otherwise, they might lose their PRI signatory benefit. And this is probably a 
quite smart way, um, and I'm, I'm starting to see in many organizations the uh, uh, the impact of that actually uh, more integrating more and being more serious about changing the investment process. So yeah, it's moving in the right direction. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, so I'm going to jump over to Nicola on this question. I'm going to come back to you, Nicola. Information that bites, information that has relevance for firms for. Your take-home messages and also some of the um, questions that were raised, both for uh, the accountability side, also the information overload question. How do we sort through the mass of standards and information that's out there? And also the plea for um, new ideas. And then I'm coming to that. Yes. <clears throat> On our side, we certainly have to do a, a strong effort uh, in terms of, uh, you know, communication, uh, highlighting really the benefits of the work we do on our side, and go really uh, hand in hand uh, with those really who can benefit from, uh, from, from the work we do. I also think, and this relates in fact to the question also around uh, leadership, uh, I would say, that's a little bit problematic in, in my view because we are uh, very much lacking, as we said also, uh, over these, uh, these two days, leadership at political level and uh, uh, visions also that could help in making people understand better, in fact, uh, uh, select what is really relevant uh, for them. So if we are also probably, but that's my view, facing that amount of work, that amount of information without really having ourselves a clear view. It's also because in front of us, in terms of leadership, we are really lacking that, that vision. I'm not too optimistic, I should confess, about uh, you know, uh, the result of the work in COP21 if uh, at this stage we cannot have, in fact, uh, the participants acting and taking clear decisions on uh, what needs to be done. That's a, a, a little bit of a problem I, I see on my side. Um, thanks very much for that, Nicola. And I mean, just to just to probe you a little bit, though. I mean, I'm thinking of China, for example, which you know grown tremendously, and internationally now taking some some important positions and nationally uh, has concepts like ecological civilization and so on. I mean, they've actually depleted their water, they've depleted their land, they've depleted their forest, but they're now reinvesting heavily, which goes to a question that Mr. Ferrari was asking about the substitution of different forms of capital, you know, natural capital for human and financial and so on. So, but I mean, and here I'll turn to you, Walter, are we seeing the leadership that we need to take these issues forward? Um, where is it? How do we nurture it? And of course, the questions which were directed to you from the audience as well. Yes. well um, first of all, I think we have to start and think in systems or holistic approaches, and that also in politics, mm. because politics is a terrible silo organization, each department doing its own thing. But on the one uh, lighthouse for these system changes, I hope will be the, the reports the Club of Rome will publish, I suppose, next week on, uh, pushed by Anders Weichmann, studies analyzing a number of European countries with an input-output uh, model to see what a change to a circular or performance industry would, the impact it would have on the economy. And the impact according to the different scenarios could be 70% less greenhouse gas emissions plus new, plus additional jobs, plus a number of other positive factors. They haven't found a single negative factor. A uh, wrap in the UK, the Waste uh, and Resource Action Program, has done a similar study using a different approach on the whole of Europe, and have come to the same conclusions. So there are some very strong indications mm. that we have to change the parameters, the way the economy is functioning. 
and then things will fall in place. Um, there was a remark on human resources. For me, the big difference between human capital and natural capital in resources is that human skills, capabilities, is the only, no, sorry, human work is the only resource that can be upgraded, that can be educated, uh, trained, so it has a much higher value. Problem is, if you don't use these skills, then they very quickly evaporate. And if somebody has been out of work for, let's say, five years, he will become unemployable. So therefore, there is a moral obligation by governments to favor the use of human labor over natural resources, such as energy. You leave a ton of coal in the ground for another 10 years, it will not change in quality, and it will not demand any social welfare. Mm. So let's become logical and do the right thing. And the, the resource question, actually resources have become cheaper from 1900 to 2000, not regularly, but overall quite substantially, and then from 2000 to 2010 the commodity prices jumped up to the level of 1900 mm -hmm. and now they are coming down again and of course nobody knows where they are going but the the, the, the business models the companies that sell resources that's sorry sell performance resources uh, goods as services they have to internalize all these external costs that they have earned. And so by internalizing the costs of risk and of waste, they change their business strategy because now it's much cheaper to prevent these costs. Mm. They have an incentive to become waste-free and risk-free, but it's because it makes them more money. And the second thing is by selling performance, selling goods and services, you also retain the ownership of the goods and obviously the embodied resources. So if you retain the ownership of the resources, then the goods in the market become the, re the resources of tomorrow at the commodity prices of yesterday. So if commodity prices should go up again, Mm -hmm. then you have a huge advantage of your competitors because you own your own resources. You don't have to buy resources. So there are several facets to, to the questions like also accounting, to the holistic accounting. But the important thing is that we have to tackle these things in a holistic way, in a systemic mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Th thanks very much for that, um, Walter. And there are some encouraging signs. I mean, if I think of the IMF's report that came out earlier this year, which estimated the total external cost of fossil fuel subsidies globally, which are around 500 billion, the total external cost around 2 trillion because of the health impacts. Um, that argues very well for what is the price of carbon by a very, obviously, reputed organization. Um, and I think for water, we'll see some similar um, pricing uh, exercises, which we'll get to the point that you made, um, Bertrand. I have to give the last word to Dr. von Weizsäcker, because he hasn't spoken yet, but just very briefly. Um, Ernst, you have the last word. There's been a, a large array of questions, information overload, tough decisions, leadership, behavior. Where do you leave it when, when you conclude, and what do we take forward from this conversation? A moment ago, you were asked, you were saying that there's a scarcity of ideas, but somebody replied, no, there's an overload of information. Both is right. But I believe we have a scarcity of judgment rather than a scarcity of ideas. I mean, on a weekly basis, I'm receiving lots of world-saving ideas by email. Uh, most of them are just rubbish, as spam. But 
I need judgment to know which is spam and which is not. So, um, I mean, I love the idea of Greenpeace buying a lignite um, uh, mining company, etc. But we had a very bad experience with this kind of ideas uh, in the context of the so-called linking directive of the EU and the clean, clean development mechanism of the World Bank with uh, so-called greenhouse gas reductions. The linking directive allowed linking domestic obligations with good uh, action outside, for instance, in China. Okay. Then the Chinese were clever people, they always are, and invented factories doing the dirtiest possible greenhouse gas emissions and then asked the Europeans to buy them out of this idea, spending millions of dollars or euros or so. And of course, the Europeans loved it because it was a lot cheaper than doing the domestic thing. And the Chinese produced more and more of those ideas. So uh, it's a great idea, but be aware of the uh, traps that you can fall into. So, judgment is my final one. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ernst. And you heard it here at the Geneva Green Cross Conference. Let's have a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you, Stephen, for moderating this very interesting panel discussion. <laughs> Sorry, but always the schedule. I mean, we have to to make the break. Just before the, the break, so the, we have a, on request of our board member, Elio Pacilio, and president uh, of uh, Green Cross Italy, we have a special guest coming from Senegal who wants to address some words quickly, rapidly, Two, two minutes, please, Mr. Giro. Mr. Giro is the Secretary General de l'Organisation, la Confédération Nationale des Travailleurs du Sénégal. Il est aussi vice-président du Conseil économique et social du Sénégal et président, président de l'Organisation régionale africaine des travailleurs. C'est un homme très important dans la région ouest africaine. Alors, deux minutes, hein, Monsieur Giro. Promis? Très bien. Allez-y. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour tout le monde. Je voudrais très brièvement vous remercier pour cette invitation, d'être présent avec vous et de découvrir tout le travail qui est fait par Green Cross et nous féliciter de la qualité des interventions, des informations qui sont fournies scientifiques que nous devons partager ensemble avec l'ensemble des travailleurs du monde. Je pense que l'environnement aujourd'hui, les développements écologiques doivent être portés par tous. D'où la nécessité de partager ces informations, ces stratégies, ces défis avec l'ensemble des travailleurs, et particulièrement ceux d'Afrique, qui, comme vous le savez, sont en perpétuelle confrontation avec des difficultés liées à l'environnement. L'Afrique est également un continent qui n'est pas pauvre, un continent riche, qui nous pensons devra jouer pour l'avenir dans l'évolution future du monde. Je voudrais donc vous remercier et dire également tout le plaisir que nous avons et remercier Green Cross pour avoir initié un projet avec nous qui met l'accent sur l'écologie par l'utilisation non, non pas des produits des énergétiques fossiles, mais sur l'économie verte à partir des photovoltaïques pour alléger les travaux des femmes et des jeunes à l'école, mais également qui permet à 900 pères et mères de famille aujourd'hui au Sénégal de pouvoir vivre dignement et d'améliorer leur situation économique. Enfin, nous pensons que Nous avons besoin de développer cette solidarité pour construire ensemble un monde meilleur et une planète plus propre. Voilà ce que je voulais dire, Monsieur le Président. Encore une fois, je vous remercie de nous avoir invités et excellente fin de session. Je vous remercie. Merci, Monsieur le Président, pour ce sympathique message. Bien, nous reprendrons notre session cet après-midi à 14h30, 2.30 p.m. Thank you very much.